All right. Well, let's uh, start the show. So welcome to Make Your Own Fun. I'm here with Joseph Grin Feinberg. He is the playwright and author of Praise Boss. Let me make sure I get the entire title here. The Erotic Adventures of Mr. Block or Labor's Loves Lost. And that is published by Charles H. Kerr Publishing Company. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, that's right. All right. And I'll... Uh, give you a little bit of a play here. So um, he is a playwright and researcher at the Philosophy Institute of the Czech Academy of Sciences, and he is also an editor for Contradictions, a journal for critical thought. So welcome to the show. And if it's uh, okay with you, I literally just finished reading the play like an hour oh. ago. So I would like to kind of um, give you some first reactions kind of while it's still fresh in my mind. Um, so first yeah, of all, <laughs> congratulations, uh, writing something like this is definitely, uh, um, pun intended, uh, a labor of love and, uh, it's not something that is, uh, easily put to the page. I don't think, um, I really like the, the zaniness, the madcap energy, uh, all of the, um, references to Joe Hill. I really like the Aggie character kind of being like a, a Greek chorus. I enjoyed that as well. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with a New York writer. Um, he was kind of the um, preeminent humorist of the day, I want to say about 80, 90 years ago, uh, named S.J. Perelman. I feel like I've heard the name, but uh, I, yeah, I'm not he, sure. He was pre predominantly published in a lot of the ne big New York magazines at the time, like New Yorker, um, Atlantic Monthly, things like that. But he is also famously known as the screenwriter, I think, I'm going to say at least two or three of the Marx Brothers films. Ah, okay, okay. Yeah. I, I well. think at least Duck Soup. So... I really enjoyed that aspect of it. There's a lot of the, um, you know, the whole falling through the roof yeah. thing. That was, that was great. You know, the whole Groucho Marx was a big inspiration. I mean, I'd say like the play is very Marxist, but you know, <laughs> a little bit Mar Carl, but very Groucho. Yeah, very, very. So much. Um, I'll be there in a half, and if that's too soon, I'll be there in a minute and a half. Um, but I enjoyed that. Um, so I guess, um, another compliment I would give is that, uh, at least in the States, we don't really see too often, um, plays that, uh, are comedic that also have a social commentary that, um, make you think. And also I think, you know, if it was performed on a stage and you would leave, you would still be thinking and maybe discussing aspects of it afterwards. So that's a credit to you. Um, I guess take me back to um, what maybe inspired the play. I know you and I have talked about it, but for the people watching and listening, they're going to kind of know what, what really brought this to life. Uh, yes, there, there is actually a story behind it, which is that, um, so I, I lived in Chicago for, um, eight years uh, before moving to Prague, where I am now. And um, I was friends with the people who ran the Charles H. Kerr Publishing Company, my, my current publisher. And um, uh, Penelope Rosemont, who was one of the, the two people who were running it, she, she and her husband, Franklin, were, I mean, they're, they're very much into the history of the U.S. labor movement and the publishers published a lot of these things like republishing old, old like labor history classics. And, and it, they also republished a series of cartoons about this character named Mr. Block that some people, if you know Joe Hill, you might, people not, might know the song about Mr. Block from Joe Hill. Um, not as many people know that before it was a song, it was a, basically a political cartoon it came out in the labor press um, and uh, and early on uh, someone put together a, a collection of all the cartoons that had come out up to that point in the first few years and so was Franklin Rosemont likes to call it like the first comic book the book of comics about this this gullible worker named Mr. Block um, 
And and Penelope Rosemont, she she once told me, or I remember her telling me that she came across in some old magazine from the labor movement a, a play, the script of a play about this character, Mr. Block. And I just like that was like that idea. I thought it was a great idea and I was letting it run through my head for a while. And then I came back to her a couple of years later and I said, So do you remember where you saw that? And she she didn't even remember having seen it. And maybe I maybe I just made up the whole thing in my own <laughs> mind um, that I just wanted there to be this play. Uh, but I figured if we couldn't find it, then maybe I should just write it myself. And you know, one one idea led to another and one idea got wackier than another. And I was really working closely with my friend, Jason Kirpan, who um, I, I almost gave him co-author status. He, he in the end, told me not to because he didn't actually write the words of the play, but a lot of the play came out of our conversations. He he's he's written like new versions of the comic, you know, like the basically the script for new new comic strips about the same character. It's always like Mr. Block tries something new in order to make it in his in his job, and it never works. He always does what he thinks the bosses want him to do, and it never works. Um, so yeah, it was like, yeah, we're talking this over and like throwing ideas off my friend Jason and and eventually after over the course of, yeah, it, it was a labor of love. Sometimes the scenes came quickly, but then I'd leave, leave, it, leave it aside for months or a year. And so it was, it took a few years altogether. Yeah, that was going to be yeah. one of my questions was uh, from the time of the concept or initially maybe putting an outline to paper to finished book in your hand was it more than three years yeah yeah definitely um i was recently i was looking at the the dates on the earliest files that i had saved because i didn't actually write it i didn't write down exactly what when i started but the earliest file let's see the earliest file i have saved here is a kind of outline of the beginning of the play from 2012 so 10 years yeah, yeah incubation that's quite period. the commitment that's again a testament to you and your fortitude for for following through and especially um with what the world's gone through in the last you know two plus years that i think you could be easily distracted or maybe in fact like a lot of people working on creative projects maybe you had nothing but free time for a certain block of time yeah, I wasn't one of those people. I think, you know, you also, well, your daughter's a little bit older. So I think I was like on the board, borderline between people who had more time and less time. You know, people who had young kids had no time during COVID. You know, my son was old enough. He could deal with homeschooling fairly well on his own. But still, like, I wasn't exactly, it, it wasn't like I was in a monastery with uh, all to myself, only, right. only writing. I was like... I still have my job. It's at home. And I also have. I well, have that's, also that's good. That's a plus that you were able to work remotely. Um, I guess uh, the next line of questioning goes for um, what made you realize that rather it being a uh, novella or um, a collection of short stories, what what lent itself to it being a play? Yeah, it's interesting. I, I didn't really, I never actually posed the question in that term, those terms, because it all started with Penelope, my friend Penelope, just saying saying to me that she thought there was a play, and I so I was starting from the beginning, asking myself if there were a play about Mr. Block, what would it look like? Um, but I but I do think there's something about the way you know because the character was in a comic and in a in a song, it was very audio visual already. And so it, it kind of lent itself to like the play has songs in it. It uses this, his song, the song about him and uh, kind of a re a re redone version in which he appears as a good guy instead of a bad guy, like in the original. Um, and uh, yeah, the, the comics are, a lot of the joke is that he has a, wooden block for a head he's a blockhead but literally in the comics he's drawn with a wooden block for a head and so so you know i could i could write a novella about a guy with a wooden block for a head and i would have to keep reminding you that he has a wooden block for a head but i, I really i like the even though it hasn't been performed yet i hope it 
will be, but um, I like, well, we did have a dramatic reading in Chicago with non-professional performers, uh, most of us. Um, and I wore, you know, box on my head. Um, but I think, yeah, part of the, part of it comes from, uh, I just like the idea of reading whatever lines that are sometimes goofy, sometimes serious. And uh, the guy has a block for a head the whole time. And um, well, let me uh, ask you this since you kind of sort of answered what I was going to ask next, but I guess during the actual uh, uh, writing process, the trial and error, um, testing out the dialogue and things like that, other than <laughs> making your relatives and immediate close circle of friends suffer by reading it back and because I've done the same thing uh, back and forth, back and forth, well, how does this work? What if I change this? Um, did you actually get uh, a few friends together or kind of say like, hey, I just, you know, just maybe like a five page scene or something. I just need to hear it to hear how it it plays here where maybe I need to have people, you know, cut off, a, you know, or extend a, a monologue or something like that. Yeah, I didn't. I, I've heard that that would be really good. And I thought that it would be good to actually work with a theater group that would actually, you know, have like actors really read the lines and try to see if they, how it worked like that. So I, I didn't really have the opportunity to do that. Well, I would have, I don't know, I could have done more organizing people, but instead I'm a part of a group of writers who write on all different genres. And so we always read stuff before meeting and then we discussed what we'd already read. So it was more like in terms of just how it sounded, it was kind of up to me to to read it out loud and think of how it sounds. But but uh but I was kind of counting on the fact that if it ever gets on stage, or when it gets on stage, um we're gonna have actors change the lines as necessary. Because oh. I mean I, I just assume that's part of it's part of the process when you, you realize that Maybe it works when I say it to myself, but maybe, you know, each each actor is a little bit different. And I want the voices, I think the voice, like every production should be its own thing and every everyone should make their own lines work in their own way. Uh, so this is, you know, it's, it's something I want, I imagine it being performed and I wrote it to be performed, but I also wrote it kind of as something with the idea that it would be read first and, um, Going back to this, there's this old tradition of the closet drama that like in the late 18th, early 19th century, you had like philosophical or romantic poets writing plays that were that were actually meant to be read. And for some reason, right. in a closet. this time it actually takes place partly in a closet. So I thought. <laughs> um, so to piggyback on that, uh, and you're talking about the reading that you had in Chicago, um how did you go about presenting that to them or or to wh where it was going to be held in terms of what the presentation uh with yourself uh i don't know if there was a moderator or not or how that was set up well it was organized by the the publisher um okay. the main editor um who's now uh tamara smith um since penelope rosemont is no longer uh, running the company anymore. But um, but unfortunately, Tamara Smith doesn't live in Chicago right now. She she went to Mexico during COVID, and um, so so she set it all up from a distance. And then I uh, then I was working with like the people who ran the venue, um, a great place called the Comfort Station in Chicago. If there are any Chicago listeners right now? Um, uh yeah should put a, give a plug to them that, so i thought it was a it was a great space um and and yeah they so they, they worked it out i think it was both like the comfort station was happy to have an event at that time and get get more stuff going on at their location and uh and yeah for me it was a chance to to reach out to both some some of my old friends in, in Chicago and and some new people and like the the union that published Mr. Block stuff 110 years ago or so um, still around the industrial workers of the world and so they came and 
and were selling some books at the event, selling their song book, which still has the, the song about Mr. Block in it. Oh, excellent. Um, so what do you think, was there a, a reaction in terms of um, people coming up after the show telling you what they liked or didn't like, or um, I, I, I use the word, you know, show loosely, but um, the reading, um, how do you feel like it came across? And were there people that came up and said, oh, I'm sure that there was a mixed bag of, there always is for every performance of, oh, I got this, this was great, because you know, you're talking about writing it for that particular audience and who you invited. But I'm sure there were other people going like, oh, I didn't know about this. I don't know Joe Hill from other than like a Joan Baez song. Um, so how, I'm just curious about um, across the board about some of the reactions that you got. Yeah, so in, in this uh, Chicago event, a lot of the people were people I know from union organizing back then. So so it was like, that was one big part of the audience and they, and and it was already planned that there was going to be a discussion session at the end. And that, that went actually really well because I had a lot of people there who were like, they were saying, yeah, I'm entertained by that. But I'm also interested in, you know, how uh, how I have someone in my workplace who acts just like Mr. Block and like, oh, it's so annoying and you go on. You know, actually I have someone else in my workplace who's like this other character and and uh, and then someone else who was uh, not from this uh, union, um, union these union circles. She was like, well, actually I kind of identify with the character who is the, the daughter of the bosses in the play, but she rebels against her parents who make her who make her work for free and to get uh, to get something to write on her college application. And, um, so I was kind of, I was happy that she you know, found this other other entry and in, into the play. And I feel like yeah, I mean like if if you write just straightforward agitprop that has sort of positive messages like this is what's good and this is why the bad guys are bad, it it definitely speaks to one audience and. Makes important points, but I think with comedy you have a chance maybe to speak to a broader group of people because you know people who did they might not autumn uh, already agree with you on all these points, but they they're willing to laugh at the problems of society together with you and like right that was, it was and, yeah um, you know we've seen the um, the use of similar type characters I think throughout um, history pop culture especially um, I really enjoyed the uh, intermission segment of the the play that was great it actually kind of reminded me a little bit of and I think it happens right in the middle of the film of uh, Citizen Kane where they're celebrating becoming the number one newspaper distributor in Chicago and um and Kane is, you know, has the chorus line come in and the marching band. And then everybody is, um, that works on the paper in terms of like the higher up editors are talking about how um, he kind of lowered himself from his inheritance to kind of be seen as one of the guys, one of the workers, one of the schlubs, you know, getting hands dirty with the ink and everything. And then once they kind of ascend and become the cream of the crop in the town. He quickly turns, you know, he has more money than he knows what to do with. And then he quickly turns uh, and just becomes the ultimate aristocrat. But uh, yeah, I really got shades of that. And also um, there's kind of an innocence to Mr. Block too, which um, I've seen time and again, which is great, kind of um, the jerk with Steve Martin, where no matter what he does or he tries to listen or tries to follow through with whatever the boss is telling him, especially if it's just dogmatic doing what the boss is telling him, it never works out for him. So, um, like I said, you know, it's, just, it's a through line for like the last hundred years or so of culture. So, yeah, and as I was writing, I also realized I. I made Mr. Block's character more and more like there's a classic character in Czech literature that American readers might uh, not be that familiar with, but it's a class. It's, a, it's become a modern European classic. It's called the good soldier Schweik. Uh, Bertolt Brecht wrote a play based on it um, uh, about 
a character named Sveik, who is such a good soldier. Uh, he, he's such a good citizen of the empire. It takes place at the begin, beginning of World War I and up through the war. Uh, so this is still Austria-Hungary. And, and Sveik is he's so enthusiastically into all of the pro-war slogans that nobody else quite believes that he could really be serious. And you and he ends up undermining the entire like discourse around it because everyone who pretends to believe in these things can't doesn't know what to do when they see someone who says them so enthusiastically that um, he like holds up a mirror to them and they realize that like nobody really believes it um, and and they all think that he he could not possibly believe it they think he must be trying to subvert the the system because nobody would really say it so. Like so innocently and so enthusiastically. Yeah, um, I uh, I think that uh, the world at large and uh, audiences around the world they they love a lovable fool, the person who stumbles into situations, um, you know, sometimes literally falling, you know, physically falling into situations, and and then you know, invariably that person becomes the patsy. They become the unwitting, you know, recipient of the ire of all of the other characters, you know, in a, in a play. And then this is going back to, you know, Greek storytelling thousands of years ago. It's kind of always been that way. But um, what, what initially, uh, I guess, drew you in terms of, I mean, you spoke about this earlier, but um, I know you have an, a, a history and an understanding of, of Joe Hill and I'm assuming that's where you first heard the, the Mr. Block song. Um, have you had any interesting conversations with other people trying to um, explain that or, or the origins of it for people not familiar uh, in terms of, uh, I guess, like the promotion of the book? Um, you know, it's one thing to have like a blurb on a book, on the back of a book, but, um, you know, and, and setting up events and things like that. Um, is it ever come across where people are going like, Wait, your book is what your play is about what yeah i was i was i was worried i mean when i first started writing and i kind of thought i'm just writing this for people who are fans of of joe hill and you know this i, I imagine it as a very small audience like for the other like inside jokes people who've read the mr block cartoons that are 110 years old and only later i realized uh, and partly after talking to people, also after I started sharing it with the group of writers in Prague, uh, I realized that actually there are things people can identify with without knowing this historical background. So like this group of writers, one of the guys said he, you know, he, he was, he like loves this, he knew the song, loved the song. He even had a friend who was an agitator named Aggie uh, in Pittsburgh. Um, but like someone else, is, you know, not not into this kind of uh, agi agitation theater at all. And and she kind of said, like, in the beginning, like, I, this is really not for me. And then and then toward about halfway through, she's like, you know, I, I really I really like Mr. Block. He's you know, he's such a he seems like such a like like such an innocent guy. Or, you know, he, <laughs> um, he he never tries to hurt anyone. So, uh, and yeah, other people like, like another friend of mine, she says, you know, she's, she's not interested in politics at all. But, um, but then I like ex described Mr. Block as a character to her. And she said, Oh, yeah, I know people like that. Um, I, you know, I, I, you know, I've been, in, I've been in a workplace, and I, I know workers who are like that. And so, yeah, so I think it, I guess it works on both levels. I didn't want to take out all of the sort of inside jokes for Joe Hill fans. There are still some of those in there, but I guess I tried to add enough of stuff that would make it make sense to other people. And it really helped going through this process of sharing it with people who are, who come from different backgrounds, different literary backgrounds or with different interests. I, I think also um, maybe you're selling yourself a little bit short that um, just as a comedic play, 
I think with the dialogue and the farce and the physical comedy, uh, the double entendres, everything, it works just as well on that where just selling it um, in terms of talking to people or promoting it as a comedy, it works. I mean, uh, it was you and I growing up um, with, you know, Monty Python and Saturday Night Live and, and Mel Brooks, that kind of really rapid fire uh, dialogue, um, even just as a reader reading it, and I, this wouldn't come across on a stage reading, but just, you know, sometimes I really enjoy things where uh, a character is talking about one thing and it's a word in the sentence and then the other person hears the word um, and they think it's spelled, it sounds the same, but it's a different word completely, completely changes the context of what is going on and the audience erupts with laughter because neither one of the characters really know what the other one is talking about, but we're kind of, you know, wanting to sometimes five steps ahead of the characters and the audiences love that too. So. Oh yeah. I, I, I definitely am one. I, I have a, an inherited taste for puns that can sometimes go too far, but uh, <laughs> I tried to take the worst ones out of the, of the script and keep the better ones in. Did any, um, anyone editing or, or reading early drafts go, Joe, just stop with this is too much. There were moments, where, yeah, there were some points like, okay, this, like that one was good, but yeah, this one was like, well, let's not, let, you know, two was a lot. Let's not do six in a paragraph. That's a lot for, even yeah, they had that kind of comment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah. And, you know, like thinking back to those, yeah, Mel Brooks and, or like the Naked Gun, or or these these uh, classic, now they're classic comedies, Monty Python. They also often have some social message, so, some satire that's going on on, a, on another level, and you can sort of walk, you can you can enjoy both sides of it. Um, sometimes it's more upfront, sometimes less so. But uh, but yeah, I think there, there's definitely a tradition to be upheld there, and I would say this. Like I was both trying to write something new and trying to maintain a tradition um, in the mouthful of of uh, things you you put uh, added to my name at the beginning when you introduced. <laughs> I mean, one of the things I studied was was folklore and, but also social theory and critical like critique of society, and this is kind of partly my attempt to like do something that's a little bit of both. It's, looking at this like traditions of the labor movement and there's, you know, some, there are moments when the characters like get into some social theory in their sometimes like confused ways. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, but also to make it funny and make it, make it. Well, the one thing about literature is, you know, you can, if you're writing a philosophical treatise, you kind of have to say what you mean. Whereas in literature, you can make the character say something that's not quite what you mean, and then the other character says something else that's not quite what you mean, and you let them bounce their ideas off each other and get confused, and the, the, the audience can decide who's right or if they're both wrong. Yeah, and I was going to point out, too, um, for people who have not uh, seen the play or, or read the book in book form, um, that you do have a kind of a foreword, an introduction where you talk about the history of Mr. Block um, going back, you know, over a hundred years and kind of explain the evolution and talk about the comic strip. Um, and I think for, in this instance, it's really valid and important that you have that up front because so the old adage of don't bore us, get to the chorus kind of thing, you want to get into the first act of the play and get the ball rolling. But I think for something like this, you really do have to have um, just a little, you know, a few pages going like, well, what is this? What is this about? Who, who are the players? What's the history of this? And um, what's, what's my way into this, into this world? I, I don't know. I've never heard of this before. And once you have that, then you can kind of literally <laughs> turn the page and then you're right into the crux of the story. So um, I think that was a really good decision. I don't know if that was your decision or the publisher's decision. That was uh, that was Tamara, the ed editor, um, publisher's idea, but I was totally along with it. And yeah, I thought Anna Hoyles, who wrote that preface, she she was a real 
great addition to the whole project. Um, she just wrote a dissertation about Mr. Block and a, sim a series of other similar cartoons in the early 20th century labor movement. Uh, so it was great to be able to have her text in there. And, and yeah, in just a few pages, give people the basic idea and, you know, they can skip over it if they want, but I, yeah, to me, there is this kind of conceptual aspect that it, it's more meaningful if you sort of know what it comes into, what the context is. If you don't want the context, you can just enjoy the puns, I guess, or hopefully not. <laughs> well, right, you know, and, and for someone like me who, who does read uh, a, a few different things during the course of a day, it's nice to just have that and, you know, maybe just skim and go, the, the, oh, all right. Oh, okay. Uh, all right. 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 Oh, okay. And then you turn to you know, page one, and then you're you've got everything set. So, it's kind of like a palate cleanser for something you might have read an hour ago that's kind of still swirling in your mind, and you're thinking about that, di you know, mentally digesting that, and then you get this little block of information. You go, okay, I've got everything I need now. I'm in the world. Um, so I guess um, in the last few minutes here, before we wrap up, uh, what is next for the play? Do you have plans here in the immediate future for it? Well, I'm going to have uh, another dramatic reading in, in uh, Prague. And maybe I'll add a couple scenes because I realized we got through them pretty quickly in the first. I just picked out three scenes in Chicago. And so I, maybe, maybe we'll do a longer thing in Prague. Um, and there's been some interest by a couple of, People in a couple of theaters, we'll see if that amounts to anything now or if it might take longer to find its way on proper stage. But um, but I, I've had a lot of people talk to me saying that they found it, they found it interesting and uh, kind of, uh, they really got into it. Like one band director and scholar at uh, in Ohio was also uh, excited about the play and um, so we'll see what happens with that. I mean, um, for now, I'm also I'm excited just to finally have it in print after all these years. I, I, I could, for the viewers. Ah, I thank you. I was going to ask if you had a copy to show people the cover. Um, and who uh, did the cover art for you? The cover art is by a Mexican street artist named Vok. Um, Bloque, actually, you can pronounce it that way, which is uh, ironically happens to sound like Mr. Block. Um, uh, he's uh, an acquaintance of the publisher, uh, Tamara. And, um, and then the graphic design was done by Dakota Brown, uh, Chicago-based graphic designer. So I thought they did a great job. And then that was the same person that did the illustrations throughout the book as well? Uh, yeah, basically, he, there's one big illustration that the graphic designer then broke up into smaller parts. Uh, oh, and some, no, he also took some, some little pictures from the original comics. Let me see if I can find the, the full art. Uh, where is it? Yeah, this is, this is the full oh, wow. design that was then used for the cover. And and yeah, then here, there, like this is this is from the original comic strip from That's 1913, great. 14. That time. And I'm I'm sure you know this from you know it's your book, but um, I really like the aesthetic of the artwork that with him being block and a blockhead and wood that all of the illustrations look like wood carvings. Yeah, yeah, really. I think it's actually um, lino cut, but it yeah. I also. It, it might as well be wood. I think lino cuts certainly easier to do for artists. But um, yeah, I love the uh, yeah, I I love the the old timey look that I think is also kind of up to date in its yeah. own way. And um, another compliment I can give you is that it's very rare, I think, to create um, not just a, a a book or a play, but a, a, any kind of work of art that kind of transcends time and place and maybe because reading it I do feel like it's something that could take place mainly in the 1950s or 40s just because of the the, the, the dialogue uh, and it, like I said it does harken back to kind of you know the Marx Brothers um, in the best way possible but um, 
you know, these themes and these situations and these institutions, they're still with us. Um, technology may have changed and some social reforms have happened, but we're, we're still in the midst of dealing with all of this and we probably will be for a long time. So um, that kind of satire is always going to be prevalent, I think, and welcome, you know. Yeah, I hope, I hope, well, I mean, I hope society will change so we don't need to write satires of this same stuff. But yeah, I mean, I think it's with us for a while. And, and yeah, I was hoping that you know, every, every group of people who wants to perform it can put their own specificity into it. You know, I left it so they don't even know what they're making in this workplace. They just do stuff. And, um, made it easy to be both both kind of both old and new at the same time but uh but yeah i would definitely i can imagine people updating it with all sorts of different different things or even if if i write a sequel which still undecided about that but if i write a sequel you know I could definitely have mr block be an uber driver or uh, <laughs> an amazon warehouse worker or something like that yeah it would work uh, okay, well, to wrap things up here, uh, where online can people find uh, you or samples of your work or access to uh, to order the book? I think the best place is from the uh, Charles H. Kerr Publishing Company website. There's a link there then to AK Press, which also which directly sells the book. Um, are you going to post the? I will. Yeah, at the end of the video and in the description. description. Also. Um, is there, uh, from the Chicago reading, is, was there a video posted to YouTube or anything like that where people can see the reading? No, no, we didn't get a video of it, unfortunately. Okay. Um, we have some we have some images uh, from it on the Facebook page of the Charles H. Kerr Company, okay. which if on Facebook you can search Charles H. Kerr. Um, okay. And I don't know if you want to promote your social media if you want people to contact you directly or <laughs> um, i'm happy if they search me joe grim feinberg on facebook yeah feel free to send me messages i'm you know i'm not the greatest social media um genius but i i'm on there sometimes and yeah. uh <laughs> i'll also point out if it wasn't uh mentioned at the top of the show it's been a long uh, 38 minutes here, but uh, Joe is in Prague, so I'm in Los Angeles, so he's nine hours ahead of me, so if you do send Joe a message uh, or reach out to the publisher, understand um, he's not ignoring you, he's literally half a day ahead of us, so um, yeah. with that, well, I'll say thank you so much for being on the show, it was great well, seeing thanks, you again. Thanks. I, uh, I just want to say before we run out of time, like, I don't know if the viewers know that this is also kind of reunion for us since, um, you know, we both got started living next door to each other, got started, well, it, let's say yeah, doing some kind of entertainment. 30 years. Yeah, yeah. Um, though I was back at my parents' house last month and found the old tapes and realized that they we need to digitalize them. And uh, <laughs> not that anyone should listen to them again, but it's... It was has historical value, I guess. I, I think so. Well, we uh, are literally, I'm sorry to cut you off. We are literally about to run out of time here on the Zoom chat, but uh, more to come. And you're always welcome to come back on the show uh, anytime. And um, with that, I'll, I'll say uh, enjoy the rest of your weekend. Oh, well, you too. Thanks. Okay. Bye, everyone. <laughs> Bye.